Greetings. Thank you for joining us. Today is December 14th, 2021. I'm Steve Shields, president of Royal Asiatic Society Korea. On behalf of the officers and council, I welcome you to our lecture. By way of reminder, lecture content does not necessarily reflect the opinions or positions of Royal Asiatic Society Korea. The Royal Asiatic Society traces its beginnings to India in the late 1700s and was formally chartered in London in 1824 by King George IV. The Royal Asiatic Society of Great Britain and Ireland granted a charter to the Korea branch in 1900, the fourth year of the Kwangmu Emperor of Korea. RAS Korea expresses sincere thanks to our generous sponsor, Asia Development Foundation, for their continuing support. We especially thank our members who have paid their annual dues. Your dues provide essential primary funding for RAS Korea. Without your membership, we would not be able to host the lecture series. We would love to have you join us. It only takes a few minutes to sign up. Membership gives you the opportunity to support the world's first and oldest Korean studies organization. For 120 years, 121 years, we've strived to explore and promote all facets of Korea's rich heritage. Members receive our annual journal transactions. Members of RAS Korea are also recognized reciprocally by most of Asia's uh, uh, RAS affiliated societies, as well as the London based original RAS. See our website at raskb.com for details. A link will be posted shortly in the chat box. If you are not a member, we request a one-time admission fee. Please refer to the chat box for that information. We're joined tonight by Rob York, Director for Regional Affairs at Pacific Forum in Honolulu. He is formerly Chief Editor of NK News and formerly a Production Editor at the South China Morning Post. His writings have appeared in NK News, the SCMP, Reason, the National Interest, War on the Rocks, and Asia Times. He's a PhD candidate in Korean history at the University of Hawaii. Tonight, he will share with us about the relationship between uh, both Koreas and the United States particularly, uh, how it has been dealt with by different uh, Republican Democratic administrations. The presidency of Donald Trump shook that up a bit. Um, so we're very interested to hear a little bit more about all of that and how that's going on. So after the lecture, as always, there will be time for questions. But please welcome Rob York. Rob, thank you. Thank you. All right, get to work sharing my screen. All right, let's start. Okay, here we go. I assume everyone can see my slides. Yep, and it look, looks good. All right, good. All right, thank you for that disclaimer. Although I'm sure this is a completely uncontroversial presentation, no one will find anything to disagree with. The status quo and its discontents, Donald Trump, America First and the Future of the US-Korea Relationship is the full title. It's the adaptation of a chapter from The Future of the Korean Peninsula, Korea 2032 and Beyond, co-edited by one David Tizard, who I think you all have heard of. There have been some additions based on some additional information that has been learned since the chapter was completed earlier this year. And we'll discuss some of the ways in which the previous administration in the US challenged the status quo on the Korean Peninsula and why those challenges ultimately did not bear fruit. Now, looking back to 2016, many of us who have been watchers of the Korea Peninsula for some time, while also following the US presidential elections have for many years asked the question of why the Korean Peninsula and the US South Korea alliance, why the North Korean nuclear issues did not get more attention during those election years. In fact, if that is the case, if one is uh, thinking that way, then one has to look back at 2016 as a veritable bonanza for Korean Peninsula watchers who are also watchers of US presidential elections because the, the issues surrounding the Korean Peninsula were discussed like they had not been in generations. 
one candidate in that election cycle asked some serious questions about the nature of the US-Korea alliance and whether or not it was beneficial to both sides. Another candidate asked whether the Chorus FDA was worth preserving, and another candidate said that he'd be willing to meet Kim Jong-un. Finally, one candidate speculated whether or not Kim Jong-un should be taken out. Looking at these different positions that were advanced during that election, it might look as though there was a very vigorous debate taking place, except that all of these positions were voiced by the same person. Donald Trump challenged the conventional wisdom on Korean Peninsula issues in a way that had not been done. There was a very narrow range of opinions expressed on the Korean Peninsula uh, by U.S. presidential candidates, especially prominent ones up to that point. And this was largely reflected in how he would govern after that. Now, before I go on to discuss how he challenged the status quo, let's define it, first of all. Status quo on the Korean Peninsula, looking back at the last several administrations before him, involved a handful of positions. What was that? Okay. Well, that was entertaining. I'm sorry about that. I think somebody <laughs> is spamming us or something. Care. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They're protesting North Korea and America. Who knows what? Maybe so. Anyway. Sorry about that. That does oh, happen, I'm told. So that's the first it's happened to us. Okay. Okay. All right. So the status quo on the Korean Peninsula as expressed by prominent U.S. presidential candidates and actual presidents over the last several decades involved defending the security of South Korea, which meant not only preserving its liberal democracy from the threat of North Korea, but also preventing war also so as to keep the gains that were made by post-war South Korea from being erased by a devastating conflict. On, uh, in addition to that, there was the position of taking a more incremental approach to North Korea's nuclear program, which is to say avoiding provocations that could lead to actual conflict, as well as avoiding elevating North Korea at the expense of the South and avoiding recognition of North Korea's nuclear program and thus undermining nuclear treaties that had been set up. Okay, so. <clears throat> okay. Trump challenged the status quo in a number of ways. Regarding South Korea, he frequently made South Korea the target of his criticism on trade as well as on the issue of military burden sharing. He also called into question the nature of the alliance as well as the need for it. Regarding North Korea, he discussed aggressive means of addressing the North Korean nuclear program to an extent that had not been seen since the 1990s and the first North Korean nuclear crisis, but also became the first president to meet a North Korean leader. So the significance of these positions are that while they often seem to be at odds with one another, they do reflect a deep dissatisfaction with the status quo that goes hand in hand with a deep dissatisfaction amongst Americans in general towards politics as usual that Donald Trump captive that D Donald Trump built upon during his presidential run in 2015 and 2016. This was also <clears throat> backed by the president's confidence in himself as a deal maker and a decision maker. And each of these positions, we'll see in a moment, found support from thinkers in the US whose opinions had largely been shut out of the mainstream that had been caught between those very narrow positions of prevent war, but also defend the South Korean liberal democracy at the same time. So in the first category of positions, okay, that challenged the status quo and found support, I have the position of against alliance. What happened uh, to illustrate this, I will use a quote from the Maryland governor, Larry Hogan, who in a Washington Post op-ed in the summer of 2020, describing uh, the 
disagreements that he had with the president, particularly over the use of, uh, of uh, the response to COVID in particular, and how he was describing how his state was essentially abandoned in his view by the, by the administration. Okay, he revealed something that was not directly related to the substance of his piece, but it kind of illustrated in his view where the administration's mindset was at. And that was that Trump said that he didn't like dealing with Moon from South Korea, and he described the South Koreans as terrible people, and he did not know why the U.S. had been protecting them because they don't pay us. Okay, this is, of course, something that Governor Hogan said, and we did not hear it directly from President Trump himself, but it is, if anything, a somewhat more exa somewhat exaggerated version of what Donald Trump himself has said. He said in April of 2020, as they were undergoing negotiations over troop burden sharing during a campaign stop, he said, I've gone to Seoul and I went to them. Now they're paying a billion dollars a year. And he said he will be back again because that's just a fraction. He said the relationship is great, but it's just not a fair relationship. Much earlier than that, not long after he took office in April 2017, he described the chorus FTA as unacceptable, a horrible deal made by Hillary. Okay. It is a horrible deal and we are going to renegotiate that deal or terminate it. So this is a position <clears throat> of challenging the alliance. This is something that was welcomed by a handful of factions within the United States. And it was by, you could call it a bipartisan position, individuals who see the US-Korea alliance as more harmful than beneficial. There are those on the left of center, academics, activists, and journalists in the US, especially academics who are active in Korean studies who feel that the alliance has benefited the US at the expense of Korea. But it is also joined by others on the right, particularly what are known as paleoconservatives and also right libertarians in the commentariat who feel that the arrangement has not benefited anyone, broadly speaking. They might say that it benefits a handful of individuals in the elite, but not the general public of either country. Examples include for instance, Professor Bruce Cummings of the University of Chicago has considered the Dean of Korean Studies in the United States, and he has long had a different viewpoint of the U.S.-Korea relationship than I would say the general public has, and has often raised questions about American conduct on the Korean Peninsula in particular. And his response to the symmetry, for instance, <clears throat> between uh, Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un was to say that, for instance, Donald Trump had a lack of experience and a lack of ties to Washington foreign policy establishment circles, and this gave him a certain freedom to do things such as canceling joint military drills. Okay. Others, such as Tim Shorek, a longtime journalist for The Nation and other progressive publications, talked a lot about the idea that South Korea is a sovereign country that needs to make its own decisions, needs to start breaking away from the relationship they have with the US. Okay. Moving on, you also find individuals to the right, Okay, and I grouped together individuals who are on what I call the paleoconservative right, but who are also what you would call right libertarians. Okay, one of them, one example of a right libertarian site would be lewrockwill.com, another would be what is known as antiwar.com. These are different from other libertarian sites such as Reason or the Cato Institute, which are largely driven by social liberalism and a devotion to uh, enlightenment ideals. Lou Rockwell, antiwar.com, and other right libertarian organizations are much more conservative on a cultural basis and are often opposed to government actions largely because they consider it to be a rival to more traditional forms of morality. But I don't want to get too far into the weeds. We can save that for Q&A if necessary. One such thinker on the right libertarian side is Professor Walter Block, who wrote at lewrockwell.com in January 2018 that the Trump should sign a formal agreement and a treaty, okay, ending the police action of 1950. This should never have been started in the first place, and it is time, past time to end it, meaning the standoff. You also have on the paleoconservative right, Pat Buchanan, who wrote in June 19, regarding symmetry between Kim and Trump. 
Among the benefits that could be offered in return for denuclearization would be recognition of the Kim dynasty, U.S. security guarantees, end of sanctions, foreign investment, and a peace treaty. Okay. The paleoconservatives and the right libertarians are not the same per se, but they have aligned on many issues. Many of the right libertarians, such as Lou Rockwell, supported Pat Buchanan's presidential campaigns in 92, 96, and 2000, for instance. All right. Okay, problems with this position. <clears throat> the U.S.-Korea alliance has been one of the great successes of the Cold War and its aftermath. And if you look at it now, rather than uh, since the sense among South Koreans that this has been a this has been an arrangement that just strongly favors the U.S. and that they do not want it, or rather a sentiment among Americans that this is a relationship that benefits South Korea at their expense. Both South Koreans and Americans poll very strongly in terms of their support for the alliance. Okay, I'll show you a chart to that effect soon. Abandoning the U.S. ROK alliance would also be deeply detrimental not only to countering and containing North Korea, but also China. This is an emerging great era of great power competition, something that the Trump administration has largely advanced, this new effort to counter China's rise in the region and withdrawing from North Korea and ending the alliance there would be deeply detrimental to that effort. Okay. Despite questions on both sides, we can say that the alliance has endured. The ROK ultimately held out and did not face the sharp increase the Trump administration had demanded that it pay to maintain U.S. troops. Okay, there was there has been approval of the alliance that has may, been maintained throughout the Trump years, even though it was somewhat shaken during that administration. However, it has largely recovered under the Biden's administration so far. And I have chart data here that suggests that the United States has largely seen defending South Korea in the event of a North Korean invasion to be within its interests. Okay, that has been something that has remained steady and has gone up in recent years, if anything. Okay. All right, next category I call give war a chance. And on this, okay, this is individuals who were in favor of a much more aggressive resolution toward the standoff on the Korean Peninsula, particularly with North Korea. And the quote I have for the beginning of this section comes from Van Jackson's book on the brink, Trump, Kim, and the threat of nuclear war. In it, a source within okay, the a source in Washington told Professor Jackson that everyone, meaning everyone in the Trump administration, wants a war now except Mattis. And this was in the fall of 2017. And this was at the time, let's see, when James Mattis was, of course, Secretary of Defense. And you had seated here, for instance, you had former National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster, the Vice President Mike Pence, and the then director of the CIA, Mike Pompeo, who would eventually become Secretary of State. He doesn't mention in this quote, then Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, because he said at that time, even though Tillerson was not in favor of uh, military action to stop North Korea's uh, nuclear weapons development, by this point in time, nobody in the Trump administration, nobody in the Trump inner circle was really listening to Tillerson anymore. Okay. <clears throat> Regarding what Donald Trump himself said, the United States, he said in 2017, in September at the UN General Assembly, the United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and his regime, hence this speech becoming known as the Rocket Man speech. And he said even earlier than that, in April of the same year, China will either decide to help us with North Korea or they won't. If they do, that will be very good for China. And if they don't, it won't be good for anyone. As far as support for this position, you can't really say that it was associated with any single movement. It is easy to decry certain individuals such as Mike Pompeo and others like John Bolton as being aligned with the neoconservative movement. But even amongst neoconservatives, this is something of a fringe position and many of the individuals who are advancing it appeared to be opportunists. This was, while not 
as widespread and not as influential per se amongst various intellectual movements in the U.S. It was more influential in the Trump administration itself for a time, especially in its early days than the position I mentioned before and the one that I will get to soon thereafter. Some of the individuals who came out in favor during this time period included Edward Lutbach, uh, who is a grand strategist, that is his field, and he wrote in Foreign Policy of January 2018 that North Korea could retaliate for any attack against it okay, using its conventional artillery against the South Korean capital. And he said essentially that the U.S. should not let this sea of fire, supposedly, that would take place as a, as <clears throat> a justification not to act because he said it would be very largely self-inflicted. In other words, South Koreans would have essentially brought that upon themselves. There are many compelling reasons, in the words of Vincent Pry, okay, including the mindset of North Koreans to act militarily now. Even as surgical conventional strikes against North Korea okay, <clears throat> may be, even risky as even surgical conventional strikes against North Korea may be, the dangers of continuing patient diplomacy are far riskier. This is uh, one of the quotes from Peter Vincent Pry, who by my account wrote at least two op-eds for The Hill and who has fashioned himself as a, an expert on electromagnetic pulse technology and weaponry and its potential use against the United States. All the damage that would come from a war with North Korea would be worth it in terms of long-term stability and national security, in the words of Senator Lindsey Graham, who made these remarks to CNN in March of 2018. So the people who were in favor of this went very high in the U.S. government at certain points. Okay. Problems with this position include war simulations on the peninsula, even without the deployment of the North nuclear arsenal, suggest a massive death toll far exceeding any conflict the U.S. has fought in decades. We'd have to go back much further than Iraq or Afghanistan. Probably if you took the entire death toll from the Vietnam War, only instead of happening over several years, it would happen over a much shorter period of time. The argument that the U.S. should go ahead with an attack are gambles that either such simulations are wrong or that the North cannot be contained, as other much larger nuclear rivals have been. And if the U.S. is willing to sacrifice South Korea, if South Korea's well-being is going to be discounted in order to prevent the North from threatening the U.S. mainland with nuclear weapons, it makes more sense to simply end the alliance and withdraw troops. I think Based on my comments on the first section, that you can tell that that is not an option I favor, but it seems like a better option than starting a war. Okay. As a result, <clears throat> President Trump's administration apparently did consider what they called a bloody nose strike, a limited attack in order to discourage North Korea's uh, development of uh, the long range missiles that could strike the US as well as the nuclear technology that could be loaded to them. And there are some accounts that suggest that he saw his early showdown with Kim Jong Un as a battle of wills. Those were the words used in Bob Woodward's book, Fear. But there are hints that suggest that Trump was never as eager as other members of his administration to pursue this route. And as soon as summitry became a possibility, he quickly abandoned it. Even at the height of the tensions, Donald Trump would occasionally tweet things about how he wished he and Kim Jong-un could be friends, for instance. Now, due to the shallow intellectual roots of this position, there have been minimal efforts to revive it since the uh, Trump administration turned instead towards symmetry. H.R. McMaster was drummed out of the National Security Advisor's position in early 2018 and has occasionally made public statements about how we need to consider for strikes in order to prevent North Korea from developing that time, kind of technology that could threaten the U.S. mainland, but as far as I can tell, he does not have the kind of audience that he used to. Now, final category is act decisively and break the deadlock. And as a quote to illustrate this point of view, John Pfeffer in the Hong Kyo Ray in January 2019, around the time of the Hanoi summit, said a summit may only sustain the illusion that negotiations are creeping forward, but even such an illusion is beneficial in light of the alternatives, a hostile standoff or an actual war. Now, regarding the idea of meeting Kim Jong-un in order to make a difference in the standoff and bring it to an end, 
Donald Trump himself said in June 2018, following Singapore, that he had learned that Kim is a very talented man. I also learned that he loved his country very much. Far cry from the Rocket Man speech of just a year earlier. And he said much more recently, last August, okay, during the height of the presidential races campaigning last year, that Putin, Chinese President Xi, Kim Jong-un, right, the Turkish President Erdogan, they are all world-class chess players. Okay, the implication being that only he could deal with them and that Joe Biden could not. And by the way, remember, we were going to be in a war with North Korea. This is something he has said many times over the, over the last couple of years of his administration in particular, that President Obama had discussed the possibility of a military action. This was documented in Bob Woodward's book, Fear. And he has seized on that as this talk of that Obama was planning a war and that it might have been carried out if he had not been elected. He doesn't really mention the fact that Obama abandoned that line of uh, reasoning pretty soon after that. So his final conclude his uh, final remarks along this, we are getting along, he and Kim Jong-un, we get along. Okay. There's heavy overlap with category one in terms of individuals who support this, but it's not exclusive. There are certain individuals and institutions on this list who are on not on record criticizing the US-South Korea alliance, but who were supportive of the summits. The former Columbia president, Charles Armstrong, is pictured here. And he said around the time of the first summits <clears throat> that the first ever meeting between the president of the US and the leader of North Korea, the Singapore summit was a historic event that has the potential to reshape security in Northeast Asia and bring a more stable peace to the Korean Peninsula. Harry Kazianis of the Center for National Interest, a good friend of Pacific Forums, has said that, said around the time of the Hanoi summit, uh, the following February, that his desired outcome for it was that Donald Trump would light America's old playbook on North Korea on fire in front of the entire world to witness. And in conclusion, Joel Witt at the Stimson Center and a longtime negotiator with North Korea said regarding their third meeting at the, at the DMZ in the summer of 2019, President Trump's 50 minute long meeting with Kim Jong Un in the Korean Peninsula's demilitarized zone was in typical Trumpian fashion, good television, but it has the potential to be something much more significant. Problems with that. Donald Trump's administration is not the first to consider a meeting with Kim, but previous administrations were not willing to validate what they saw as bad behavior from the North, first of all. And <clears throat> looking at North Korea's own patterns of behavior, North Korea tends to decide on symmetry, whether with the US, South Korea, or China based on its own timeline, rather than an inter external enticement or external threats, as I think many people have assumed was the case in, uh, in the previous administration's case. Meaning one cannot naturally aver that Pyongyang has come to a summit with the intent on reaching a deal of the sort that its counterparts seek. North Korea has also historically been very capricious in carrying out the terms of previous deals or has demanded terms partners would be unwilling to accept. And here in the picture, you see that Kim Jong-un is meeting Xi Jinping. Around the time that Kim Jong-un met Donald Trump, uh, three different times, and around the time he also had several different meetings with Moon Jae-in. He also had meetings with Xi Jinping, and this is a pattern that has played out more than once. In 2000, around the time that Kim Jong-il met the South Korean presidents, and around the time that Madeleine Albright came to visit him, around the same time, Kim Jong-il also repaired some rather frayed ties with China as well. So this tends to suggest that North Korea tends to break its diplomatic isolation due to internal conditions and an opportunity to mend ties with more than one country at one time. Okay, results of the symmetry. In one summit, there was amity, but little tangible results. The second summit achieved neither amity nor substance. And the accounts of the Hanoi summit suggest that Kim wanted more than President Trump was willing to offer in the end there were limits to how much President Trump was willing to break with precedent, and that summit ended rather disastrously, especially for the North Korean side, as Kim Jong-un supposedly left in a very foul mood. <clears throat> in conclusion, 
Now, regardless of what I have said about the Trump administration's handling of the Korean Peninsula, I feel that it has made important contributions to U.S. foreign policy on the People's Republic of China, on Taiwan, and also on the quadrilateral security dialogue. As one of my colleagues, Pacific Forum President Emeritus Ralph Kwasa likes to say, the Trump administration's foreign policy was like the music of Wagner, it was better than it sounds. However, the legacy of their Korea policy seems to have been the reinforcement of the status quo as the alternatives have not proven successful and or desirable. It is worth remembering that foreign policy in countries around the world is set based not only on national interest, but also how national interest is perceived in the country and amongst its voters and particularly among particular voting bases. Okay, so there is a tendency, at least in this case, for people to assume <clears throat> that their chosen candidate is acting in their interest. And that seems to be something that we saw in the last president in that his support never really wavered amongst his base, regardless of whether or not he was taking a particularly hawkish or dovish stance. Now, I sometimes like to imagine what would have happened if President Trump had been reelected. There are those who suggest that he would have withdrawn his troops from South Korea. I'm not so sure of that. I think institutional factors might have prevented it. I think there's a very strong chance they would have prevented it, for instance. And nonetheless, he was not reelected and instead Joe Biden was. Now, what can we say about how Joe Biden is handling things? Well, a year in, the Biden administration has shown a much more constructive attitude towards Seoul and has done a great deal in terms of repaying, repairing ties that had gone through some rather unfortunate moments under the previous administration. However, its North Korea policy is unclear. There was a North Korea policy review supposedly carried out earlier in the year, but its results were not made public. And we can really only assume that there hasn't been a major change of course recommended. I suspect there are reasons for that, but we can go into that later. Frustration with the status quo in the Korean Peninsula and elsewhere is real and will persist, and we will probably see it return in future presidential campaigns. However, while I understand the Biden administration's reluctance to take a different position on the Korean Peninsula, I think the failure to put forth constructive policy on the peninsula could haunt this administration and the country because North Korea is surely adapting its methods and using them to advance its nuclear interests. Okay, and with that, I will conclude. Rob, thank you. Very interesting. Um, you know, when, when we're kind of living through that as just ordinary folks, not scholars or, or specific observers, we don't often see that as you've summarized it, that's, that was very helpful for us. I, I think it was for me. So, uh, time for questions. Um, the, just, uh, unmute your mic and jump in. Uh, with a question, I, uh, I I have a question that I'd like. To, what's your take on Moon Jae-in's proposal to have an end of war declaration <clears throat> in in the light of everything that we've talked about tonight? I think Moon Jae-in administration, uh, Moon M himself recognizes that his time is almost up and that his outstretched hand to North Korea was was not reciprocated. And so he's looking for something that he can hang on as a as a kind of as a way to establish a legacy, essentially. So and I think it's not just politics per se that he's interested in. I think there is if you look at the the history of South Korean progressivism, there has been a tendency to view the division of the peninsula as the legacy of outside interference, okay, that, in, that not only led to their colonization, but also led to their division, led to war, led to a period of military dictatorship, and the 
end of national division is kind of seen as a way of finally healing the mistakes of history. So there, there is that ideological element. So I, I assume that President Moon is not just doing that, not just advocating that because he thinks it's good for his legacy. He thinks it's actually what's right for the country. I don't agree because I think that North Korea has not really <clears throat> demonstrated that they are interested in changing their ways. And it's not just a matter of them advancing their nuclear program, advancing their long range missiles. We've not really gotten North Korea to apologize for, or in many cases, even acknowledge past asymmetric attacks they've launched against South Korea, whether it's the Shunin sinking, the Yunpyeong bombardment, or the mine incident in 2015. So, assuming that a declaration of the end of war is going to change that behavior, I think is assuming a lot. And I don't think that assumption is necessarily justified, but an end of war declaration could be used to say disassemble the UN command at the DMZ. It could be used to say that, okay, the US and South Korea alliance should be downsized, it is no longer necessary. And it could be used to say that uh, the sanctions should no longer be in place. So and essentially North Korea could get a lot for having done very little. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question if I may. Um, thank you, Rob. Great presentation. Uh, two questions, uh, if I could. Uh, one, the first one is about President Biden and his administration. If uh, President Trump pursued diplomacy, well, he did. Does that mean that's kind of off the table for President Biden now? If they go for an anything but Trump policy, they cannot be seen to be doing what their great rival, this enemy of America, perceived did. So does Trump's actions now kind of mean that's off the table for the Democrats? And does that make things actually harder for President Biden? That's the first question. And sorry to give you two, but I, I'm very curious. Also, from a South Korean perspective, you mentioned some of President Trump's bellicose language towards South Korea. He said very derogatory things about them. During this time, President Moon said President Trump should have a peace prize and he, and he, he kind of played lovey-dovey with him. And he, you know, everyone said he didn't really mean it, but he still did it rather than kind of sticking up for his people. Or his, do you have any take on President, President Moon's uh, position during all of that, President Trump's America's first policy? So those two questions, if you... Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, two questions, no problem with that. Um, okay, let's see. Trump's diplomacy, would that rule out diplomacy by the by the Biden administration? And I would say not necessarily. I would say that the reason you're not going to see the Biden administration return to summits in be between the between President Biden and, and Kim is simply because that sort of thing is has been looked down upon by the by the consensus by the foreign policy community for some time and there's lots of reasons for that um i remember speaking to someone years ago at the cato institute who had a very who was very friendly to the idea of you know warmer ties between the two countries and who believed that uh, there could be the possibility of of face-to-face -face meetings between an American president and a Korean, North Korean leader. And he said at the time, you know, but we can't, but that's not something we would do right away. There would be steps leading up to it. And that is not what happened under President Trump, of course. Um, in the spring of 2018, Donald Trump was still talking about sanctions enforcement and the possibility of something much worse. Then came the Winter Olympics, then came Kim Yo-jong coming to Seoul, then came closer rapport between North and South. And next thing you know, Donald Trump is being invited to a summit and he accepts it. Uh, so basically, there was no step-by-step -step process. He simply showed up. And many people who are 
long-term watchers of the negotiations process itself have said, you don't ever send the president to a summit, okay, to work out the deal. You send the negotiators to work out the deal and the president goes and signs it. That's how it works. Instead, what we got was President Trump showing up, okay, without a deal solidified, thinking that he could simply get the North Koreans on to see things his way. And the North Koreans apparently seeing things quite differently, seeing it basically the opposite, that they would simply get what they wanted. Like I, I mentioned that uh, Kim was very disappointed by the outcome of Hanoi. If you, if you read Ankit Panda's book about uh, the North Korean nuclear program, it says that he essentially demanded the lifting of the vast majority of U.S. sanctions in return for pretty minimal concessions. And apparently he was quite surprised that this did not work out because apparently he left the scene and wouldn't talk to any of his aides, just simply went to his room, shut the door and would not speak to anyone. So <clears throat> there was... Yeah, there was an assumption going into this summit that uh, both sides were pretty sure that they were going to get a deal that was favorable to them. The uh, U.S. side never seems to have abandoned the idea that there would be CVID within four years, essentially. I think <clears throat> the if, if there's a return to symmetry, there will have to be a lot of steps in between now and then to actually make that happen. And... The Biden administration has not ruled out diplomacy entirely. They do make certain statements, certain gestures toward the idea of it, but they're saying that the North Koreans are not returning their calls. So when North Korea is ready to negotiate, we will see something, but they evidently are not ready to see that for the time being. So... <clears throat> Okay, regarding the South Korean perspective and Moon's response to uh, the derogatory language by, by Donald Trump, <clears throat> I think that, let's see, Moon Jae-in was not really in a position to do things differently, at least not in pursuit of the objectives that he had and his objectives were largely reconciliation with the north that has been a pretty high priority of his if he were to basically pick fights with the trump administration over that that would have been quite detrimental to that objective basically um if he'd had a different objective which really was okay we are going to stake an independent position from the u.s regardless of what happens then that would have been a, a stance he could have taken now what did he really think about donald trump i mean <clears throat> as soon as donald trump was out of office moon jane suddenly became a very big supporter of the of the biden campaign and its messaging saying that america is back and Suddenly he's appearing in, you know, publications that let's just say a liberal Democrat is likely to read, such as the New York Times and Time magazine talking about how the Trump administration did not have the strength of character or I can't remember exactly how he put it, but basically they didn't follow through. And I saw that as a very clear attempt to kind of win over Biden's base. And started to say, okay, Donald Trump didn't have the courage to go to the next level with North Korea, but Biden can. It's kind of bandwagging, bandwagoning. It's kind of um, <clears throat> fickle, but it's it's good diplomacy from President Moon. Do you think? I think. Well, it's it's hard for me to say because I don't really share President Moon's ultimate objective. I think that his ultimate objective is misguided. I think that <clears throat> he savvily advances the position that he supports. So you, in that sense, yes, it is good diplomacy. Uh, I just feel that it is toward an unproductive end. Thank you, Rob. <clears throat> Thank you. I care to 
predict the uh, upcoming Korean presidential election and how things will be? No, I'm just, I, I'm not serious about asking you to do that. Okay. <laughs> it, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out and, and where we head from next May, I suppose. Yeah. Um, anybody else, any other questions? I don't see anybody burning up the screen with frantic hand waving and unmuting of mics. Let's see, Byron. Uh, uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I meant to correct that for you, Byron. Byron uh, made a typo. He's grandson of Victor Wellington Peters, not a son. Uh, a question, uh, what roles are other nations with normalized relations with North Korea in breaking the status quo? <clears throat> what roles are other nations taking or what other playing, I suppose, is, you know, because we've seen Britain in, in recent years, normalized relations, etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let's see. <clears throat> well, let's see. Um, European powers are definitely looking to take a more active role in the region, the EU, UK and others are, are, are unveiling Indo-Pacific strategies, for instance, and upping their, their naval presence in the region. So they're, they're definitely interested uh, in the future of this region, and they are definitely looking to play a more active role, either in concert with the US or independently. Um, but in terms of the role that they actually intend to play on the Korean Peninsula specifically, it's a little bit hard to say. France, France, to my knowledge, does not have direct relations with North Korea. The UK does, but they have not been that active of a player in terms of negotiations with, uh, with North Korea. Um, in terms of how just other regional players, I think the position of the position of China and Russia is interesting in the sense that <clears throat> both of them definitely like to talk about the idea of greater reconciliation. And one of the things that we do at Pacific Forum is actually we host dialogues on this topic. And uh, our Chinese and Russian colleagues will often talk about a lack of trust between North Korea and the United States and say that they want to have that built up. They want to have greater <clears throat> rapport between the U.S. And, and North Korea, largely because that kind of stability is better for them in the long term. They prefer that in their, in their backyard. But that's not to say that they support the South Korean position. And I think one of the things that the South Koreans have come to learn, especially about the PRC, is that the PRC does not share its objectives for the Korean Peninsula. They do not desire unification. They really only want stability. A unified, a reunified Korean peninsula is not really in Chinese interests, especially if it falls more under the influence of, of Washington. So <clears throat> that is something that I've heard from, from South Korean diplomats pretty much directly, that they once thought that China would help them with unification and that they're starting to realize that that was never the case. Okay, Russia... <clears throat> is similarly inclined and in that they want to see greater stability. But from what I have heard is that they also are against the idea of unification because they don't want to see a unified Korean peninsula allied with either the US or China. So um, while they will definitely support additional negotiations, neither of those countries is really willing to take a position, a risky position for themselves, one that would potentially destabilize North Korea or at least cause them to push their you know, two neighbors away in that sense. So other countries that are stakeholders, such as, say, Japan, we're not seeing any real signs that they're very keen on an, on an end of war declaration. Uh, they remain very skeptical to a degree, 
I'd say a greater degree than South Korea is about North Korea's intentions. So <clears throat> really, yeah, it's uh, the current government in South Korea that supports uh, this line of reconciliation with North Korea and the, the Chinese and Russians support it insofar as it uh, cools down the temperature in the region. I think you're muted. Muted. Yeah. Uh, coming from the chat box, Byung-Gyu uh, asks, in what ways was the separation of Korea into two guided by the internal force as opposed to foreign influences? <clears throat> that, is, that is an interesting question because when the Korean Peninsula was divided, uh, it was led for the most part by, by individuals who had really spent an inordinate amount of time outside of Korea. Kim Il-sung had spent most of his time in Manchuria and spoke better Chinese than he did Korean. And Syngman Rhee had, of course, spent a couple of decades in the US uh, and elsewhere, mostly, mostly uh, building up his skills as a lobbyist for, uh, for the cause of Korean independence. And even after he was ousted and Park Chung-hee took his place, Park Chung-hee was uh, trained by the Japanese military and spoke Japanese as more or less his first language. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and that is the different, the difference in narratives, the, the Korean independence movement and that uh, started with the March 1919 movement, but that was the, the, the early ROK government saw itself as the successor of that of that movement, March 1919, and they celebrated it every year and uh, kind of took, and they, they, yeah, took pride in those who resisted Japanese colonization from within and also who resisted it from within Western countries, whereas North Korea has, has actually said that those resistance movements failed and that their resistance movement in Manchuria amongst the guerrillas Okay, was more successful. According, of, of course, to North Korean historiography, they liberated the northern half of the peninsula by, by taking it back from Japan, which, of course, we all know is not correct. But still, that is, that is their perspective. So <clears throat> in some sense, you could say that uh, the Korean peninsula is divided by two different narratives over how to how Japanese occupation ended and who was <clears throat> responsible for it ending and also what happened to the Japanese collaborators. Of course, the North Koreans say they got rid of all of theirs and the South Koreans were basically putting their, North Korea, their, their Japanese collaborators back in positions of power and so on and so forth, which is a gross oversimplification. But yes, you could say South Korea was friendlier to its Japanese occupier, occupiers, but yeah. Oh, uh, am I? I didn't mute, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Jeffrey Robertson asks, without pushing you to predictions, what about your opinion on what we could see if there were a second Trump administration? Well, <clears throat> I assume you mean if he is reelected in 2024. If I'm correct on that, I can talk about that a little bit. And if if Donald Trump is reelected in 2024, um, there will be it will definitely be different from what would have happened if he had been reelected this time around, because I would say that I would say that certain events, particularly January 20, January 6, have, I would say, soured him um, in the eyes of what you might call the former what you might call respectable Republicans. You could put it that way. Um, many of them, okay, after what they saw on January 6th, would probably want nothing to do with him. And the, and the Trump early years versus what happened <clears throat> by the second half was somewhat instructive in that early on in his tenure, he was surrounded by a lot, by, by numerous generals, you know, Jim Mattis, of course, um, 
at H.R. McMaster, although I think he was quite wrong on a number of subjects, and also uh, see General Kelly as well. And all of those individuals, I think, saw themselves as, con as performing a necessary task of bringing order to an American administration. And as they like to say, you know, what's good for the What's good for the administration is good for the U.S., you could say. Um, however, by the second half of his administration, once a certain degree of stability had been established and the early you know, dysfunction of his first few months had, had really been put in the rearview mirror, <clears throat> he started turning away from individuals such as that and leaning more toward loyalists and that's when you got to see people like mark meadows and others who were much more <clears throat> inclined to support the president uh, and, and his and his whims you could say so if he's re-elected in 2024 i mean he has really been surrounded by individuals who see cozying up to him and really carrying out his ambitions as very good for their careers. Uh, Mike Pompeo was willing to swallow whatever you know, personal opinions he might have had about meeting with Kim Jong-un and simply try to advance President Trump's positions on, on summits and so forth. But um, Mike Pompeo has also made it pretty clear he intends to run for run in 2024 himself as well. So I think if Donald Trump is reelected, you're going to see him surrounding himself more and more with loyalists and not with people who really understand the basic functions of the government positions that they will be assuming. That's not going to be the best situation for not only the Korean Peninsula, but other situations as well. I hope I'm incorrect about that, but um, we will see. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> uh, Byung-Gyu uh, writes, thank you so much for your wonderful answer, Rob. If possible, one clarification, please. Has there been a <clears throat> plan to strike North Korea first by the US? beyond calculation or consideration on table. Mm -hmm. There supposedly were actual scenarios that were being drawn up for the so-called bloody nose strike. Uh, I've seen reports, it's been a long time since I saw them, but I have seen reports that there were, that there were individuals who were involved in that, in that process of actually trying to prepare scenarios where negotiations and sanctions both failed and much more strident measures were actually being discussed. Um, <clears throat> from what I have heard, let's see, this was, this was, in, this was in the days that uh, Mattis was Secretary of Defense and he had a tendency to reply to any request for specific plans to actually strike the North by saying, okay, we'll get on that and then not following up. So essentially he would slow walk any efforts to draw up a specific plan to, to strike North Korea. But um, yeah, <clears throat> apparently such, such measures were under discussion, but they have not, may not have gotten much further than that. And like I have mentioned, uh, President Obama toward the end of his term actually was quite alarmed by North Korean, uh, North Korean uh, nuclear weapons development. Uh, and actually did talk about some options for dealing with it forcefully, but he ultimately rejected them when he saw what they would what they would require and what they would cost. So well, we we know that those joint military exercises between the South Koreans and the US are all preparation for invasion of North Korea. Mm -hmm. if we listen to North Korea Central News. Right. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, very good. Ken, mm -hmm. that is an awful big pot of coffee you've got there. Good for you. 
Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Rob, thank you again for a, a really interesting discussion. Really appreciate you staying up late and uh, doing that for us. Our, our uh, uh, literature club will have its next meeting on January 6th. They'll be considering a short story called The Wayfarer Never Rests on the Road by Lee, Je Lee Je Ha. Not quite sure how to pronounce a Romanized Korean name with the letter Z uh, in it, or Z. Um, we'll launch our 2022 lecture series on January 11th at 7.30 p.m. with Kim Dong-jin. Uh, DJ is the founding chairman of the Hulbert Memorial Society. Uh, it's a body to... Uh, commemorate Dr. Homer B. Hulbert, who was uh, an early missionary educator, uh, but a strong proponent uh, of the Korean independence movement and uh, had a great passion for Korea, was a scholar, wrote uh, numerous books. Uh, DJ uh, worked for 30 years uh, uh, in uh, mostly J.P. Morgan Chase as a banker and spent uh, time in New York for the bank. And when he retired uh, uh, from JP Morgan, he was managing director uh, and country manager for Korea. Uh, DJ read Holbert's Passing of Korea, a 1906 tome ab about the Japanese taking over and uh, was struck by Holbert's passion. And uh, in his retirement years, he wants to ensure a place for Dr. Holbert in the annals of Korean history. He's largely been forgotten by the Korean public. Um, so in 1999, he organized the uh, Holbert Memorial Society and he's been producing uh, several books in Korean language. Holbert was in English, but uh, DJ has been even translating some of Holbert into Korean. Uh, so uh, he will uh, share with us on uh, January 11th. Please check our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find recordings of past lectures and uh, other uh, helpful content. I wish you all a very happy Christmas and a blessed new year in Korean tradition. Have a good evening. Thank